All right, I still have a couple people joining on, so I'm just gonna wait one more minute. <clears throat> this broken down by our topic. So um, first of all, we're going to look at sensation. Then we'll cover a slide on the vision. The third slide will be the other senses and the fourth slide will be perception. So we have four different slides. Here is the first one. All right, sorry, that's my coffee, Brian. I'm having another cup. I have to teach my college class after this tonight. Okay, so you will need to know. All right, sorry, I was interrupted. All right, so you will see a question on there that compares sensation to perception. Again, sensation is everything that's coming in through your senses, so everything you see, hear, taste, touch, and smell. So that's your detection. And your perception is your interpretation of that. So detection versus interpretation or how you perceive it or make sense of it. All right, sensory adaptation, the best example I can think of is when you walk in my room, you smell coffee. After you sit there for a while, you don't smell it any longer. You've adapted to that sensation. So when you're repeatedly exposed to something for a prolonged period of time, you fail to recognize it. Um, absolute threshold. That is when you first detect a sensation. So... I gave you the example, if I were playing a song on my computer and I asked you to raise your hand when you hear it, if I had it down at zero and started turning it up, when you can detect that is your absolute threshold. And it's normally a rule of thumb, like 50% of the time. Um, anything falls below that uh, would be referred to as subliminal. I gave you the example of a dog whistle. You blow a dog whistle, there's still sound waves traveling through the air. They're just at a frequency that you cannot detect. A dog has more receptors in the air so they can hear it. Um, so that is subliminal. It's a, a sensation that you are unaware of. It's below your threshold. Um, selective attention simply means uh, you can only focus on one thing at a time. We cannot multitask. So you have to choose what you want to pay attention to. And sometimes if you're focused on one aspect in your visual field, then you fail to recognize others. Right, so that was inattentional blindness. And then change blindness is when you fail to see a subtle change that occurs in front of you. And I gave you the example of the door study. So one person was talking to a random person in the park asking directions. 
and unknowingly to the person giving directions, they bring a door through one person that they were talking to leaves and somebody else takes their place. And now they fail to recognize that is a new person. And about two thirds of all people or 70% fall for that. All right, so I'm gonna put up the vision. All right, so first term here, um, we're looking at accommodation. So that is the process of the lens changing shape to cast the image onto the retina. So the lens changing shape, accommodate means change. So changing shape to cast the image or the light waves onto the retina. I'll come back to parallel processing. So once that image or that those light waves get to the retina, you have rods and cones, which are your photoreceptors or your nerves. So in the retina, those photoreceptors, the rods and cones convert the light wave to a neural impulse. That's transduction. So think of transfer, transduction, transferring light wave to a neural impulse. All right, rods and cones are your nerves, your photoreceptors in the eye. So cones are active in when it's light and allow you to see color. So if it's light out, your cones are active and they allow you to see color. Your rods are active whenever it's really dim and they're associated with black, whites and shades of gray. All right, so in our cortex, our visual cortex and also uh, the auditory cortex for hearing, we have these feature detectors that allow us to process everything we see and hear at the same time. That's parallel processing. So whenever you look at something, you see the shape, the motion, the color, the distance, all at the same time. You process them parallel. Same with hearing. You hear the volume, you hear the tone, you hear the pitch, all at the same time. So that's parallel processing. So it's vision and hearing. Uh, the iris, you all know, is the little muscle, the colored portion around the uh, pupil. And that controls the expansion and contraction to let light in or keep light out. And then your blind spot, that is where the optic nerve leaves the eye. There are no rods and cones there. And I showed you in class how to find your blind spot. All right, so move in, into all the other senses here. So there's not as much information with those.
you have all those down, Anna? Okay. I'm just going by you since I can't see anybody at home. Okay. Um, also add the middle ear. Okay. Um, so I'll just talk about the middle ear since I told you to add that before I forget. So you'll need to know what the three little bones are in the middle ear, the hammer, the anvil, and the stirrup. <clears throat> and that also the cochlea is the inner ear, the cochlea. I forgot to put the ear information on there. All right, so there is a question also about your touch sensations. So they would be temperature, pain, and pressure. And with temperature, it's not hot and cold, it's warm and cold. Kinesthetic receptors, I should have told you, we don't, we're not doing that. So don't worry about the kinesthetic, that's something for AP. If there's a question on the test about those, I'll just give it to you. Um, your chemical senses are smell and taste. And your gate control theory is the idea that there's a channel or gate in the spine. Make sure you associate that with the spine. It opens up when nerve pain nerves in our skin are activated or stimulated. So the gate opens up, that impulse travels to our brain and we experience pain. Sensory interaction is when one sense interferes or influences another one. So when you can't smell, you can't taste is the best example. All right, so that brings us to our last slide on perception. All right, so this would have been the video that you watched last Friday um, with the substitute. All right, so this in that video lesson, you learned about depth perception. Um, the visual cliff, that is a test for infants to determine when they develop depth perception. So you might recall in the video, you saw the table that had the tablecloth over part over a table and then there was a glass table on top and the mother would try to encourage the child to cross over the glass but it appeared to drop off so most children when they can move they won't cross that gap so that leads us to believe that when children can actually crawl they have depth perception um shape and color constancy so 
perceptual constancy means if the form changes, we still perceive it as not changing. And I know that seems confusing, but think of shape constancy. If you look at a door, it looks like a rectangle. When you open the door, the image cast on the retina becomes a trapezoid, but you still see it as a rectangle. You still perceive it as unchanging. So it stays constant. Color constancy as well. Um, we talked about rods and cones. Whenever you're in the dark, a dark area, your cones are not activated, so you cannot see color. But if you look at a brick wall, you'll still perceive it as red because you know that bricks are red. So the color remains constant, even though you really can't see that. Your brain tells you it's red. Um, we tend to group things that are similar. That should be easy for you to, to pick out on the... Um, like if you see a bunch of people at a game and they all have blue shirts on and you're playing Allegheny, you would just assume that they're Allegheny fans because they have similar color shirts on from the school. <clears throat> Closure, our mind tends to just fill in the gaps. On the video, you saw a triangle and it had like three openings. Well, you didn't see a triangle. You saw a figure that had like three openings and there wasn't a triangle drawn, but your brain perceived it because it was filling in the gaps. And our mind just naturally does that because we like to make sense of things through perce our perception. Um, gestalt, here you want to associate that with the whole. Like this is when you first see something or perceive something, we take in the whole big picture first. And then our mind breaks down the details. So that forest scene that I showed you, first you see the forest with the two horses and the man, but after you start to look closer, after a while you start to see faces. So that's gestalt. That's the way we organize things and we tend to see the big picture first. Um, your perceptual set is your background or experiences that cause you to interpret things different from one another. So I think I told you in class, or maybe it was on the video, um, like I, I went to Broadway musicals my whole life. My family, we always went to New York to see plays. So I loved them. My husband, I thought I would be nice. And when we got married, I got uh, tickets to go see Les Mis on Broadway. And he fell asleep within the first five minutes and they were expensive tickets, but he had never been to a Broadway musical before. So he didn't have that perceptual set, that background. So I learned my lesson, um, but uh, that's why we interpret things different than one another because of our experiences and the way we've been raised. Um, perceptual adaptation, this was on the video about vision. So, um, you should have seen the, the woman who put on the uh, goggles that made everything upside down. And just within a couple of days, she was able to completely adapt to an upside down world. She could ride a bike, she could write her name, she could pour her coffee. So our brains have such plasticity that they're able to adapt to a very distorted, uh, and here we're looking at vision, a distorted visual field. So we're able to adapt to unusual surroundings. That was sensory adaptation. Yes, yeah, sensory is when you sense something and then after you're exposed to it for a while, you fail to recognize it. So that's your senses. Uh, perceiving is your interpretation. So you're able to interpret a world that's even upside down over time. You're able to adapt to it. That's the difference between them, yep. Um, precognition and psychokinesis, um, they were from ESP. Precognition is a prophecy or predicting a future event. Like predicting, you know, who's gonna win the lot, they're gonna win the lottery, that'd be nice. Um, psychokinesis, you're controlling things with your mind. And that was like Carrie, the movie Carrie. 
you know, she could look at doors and make them slam or look at a, a wall and make it catch on fire. So again, nobody's ever been able to prove either of those. But All right, so that is everything that you will need for your quiz tomorrow. And keep in mind, I'll be doing a review tomorrow after school for the exam on Thursday. So I'll be here for another uh, for a couple more minutes. If you have questions at home, if not, go ahead and log off and I'll see you tomorrow.